For those online and those visiting today, I want to welcome you. My name is Tom Hall, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you today. I have been um, preaching a series of topical messages. Collins likes to go verse by verse through the Bible, and I enjoy that too. But sometimes I just God puts these topics on my heart. And over the last couple of months, I've had the opportunity to speak regarding various qualities of our God his power, his love, and his forgiveness. And today I want to speak on the wisdom of God. The topic is too broad, and I've taken on too much. I can't possibly cover the wisdom of God in one message, of course. He is an infinite God, and his wisdom extends to all of creation. But he has given us his word, and he's given us... uh, in that word, a description of his wisdom and what it means for us to partake of that wisdom. You know, it seems to me sometimes that we have been Christians for a while, we get uh, cavalier in our attitudes towards the word. It's not that we don't care, but rather we've read the Bible, we've sat in Bible studies, and we've listened to preachers give sermons on the meaning of the word. But our relative familiarity with the Word of God can be a trap. In our assumption that we know and understand our Father's Word, we can grow presumptuous. This reminds me of what Paul said in Ephesians 3, verses 16 through 19. I'm just going to read those. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner self, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being routed I'm sorry, rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to all the fullness of God. I love this passage of Scripture because it reminds me that our striving to know God is only effective as we allow the power of God's Holy Spirit to work in us. Further, as we place our faith in Christ Jesus, we become grounded in love and our comprehension of Jesus' love, which is a spiritual understanding. It causes us to be completely filled to the fullness of God. This is not an infilling of intellectual understanding. However, it is knowing God and being known by him at a level far deeper than our minds comprehend. We are known by God and filled by him with his power. We encounter this knowledge through the study of God's word and through praise of the Father of lights. We've just spent time in praise, and I'm so glad that we were able to do that because that is our offering to God. And I prayed before the service that God would receive that as it was intended, which is our praise, our appreciation of our Heavenly Father. And I'm grateful for the opportunity that we've had to lift high the name of Jesus, to glorify our Lord, to thank him for the many good things he's done for each of us. I am amazed every day at the blessings of God, and he's just pouring those blessings out upon me. If he's not pouring those blessings out upon you, consider your ways. Maybe you're missing something. Align yourself with God's ways, and you will receive the blessings that he has in abundance for each of us. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. I am excited by this because I just feel God's presence even now as he's stirring in hearts, you know. So praise God. Proverbs 9, 10, verses 10 through 12 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you alone will suffer from it. I don't know how God could be any more direct than that, you know. Um, If you choose the path of wisdom, it is beneficial to you. It is worthwhile to seek the ways of God. The writer of Proverbs guides us in this passage to wisdom. The fear of the Lord might be better said as the reverent awe of the Lord. As children of God saved by faith in Jesus, we don't come to the Father in terror, but rather in joy. 
the realization of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus leads to appreciation and awe on our part. You know, when I would come home from work as, when my kids were little, I'd come in the door, and my kids would run to me, Daddy, 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 and they'd all want to be lifted up and picked up and hugged, and, and they would want to tell me about their day and stuff. And there's not one time when I walked through that door and they came running up to me that I said, Get away from me, and knocked them aside. I would never do that. I love those children. They are a gift to me from God, and they're precious in my sight. They're precious to me today, and my youngest is uh, 36. I mean, you know, and if they came running to me today, I would rejoice in that. If they actually gave me a phone call, I'd rejoice, to be honest with you, but uh, just, just kidding. Um, they, no, they're beautiful children, and I love them. But our God receives us with joy. He's not offended when we come to him. He rejoices with us in this fellowship, this relationship that we have with him. Isn't that good to know? I mean, isn't that good to know? Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. It just blesses my soul to know how much God loves us and rejoices in us. It amazes me that God would care about me at all. I know what a screw-up I am. I, I keep it from you as much as possible, but he knows. He knows the screw-up that I am. And yet, he continues to look forward to hanging with me. And he does the same with you. What a blessing to know that. Well, not only has God blessed us, but as we study his word, we obtain wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. He continues to pour out blessings upon us, even extending our lives so that we might serve him and see more of the works of his hand. Paul provides a treatise on wisdom in the book of 1 Corinthians, starting in chapter 1, verse 18, and stretching on all the way into chapter 4, he contrasts the wisdom of God with the wisdom of men. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 31. I know this is a long passage, and I'm just going to plow through it. There's so much here that I encourage you to take these scripture references, go home, and reflect upon them. Read them and reflect upon them, because there's a lot here. I do not promise to get through all of that today. I'm giving you a very surface kind of approach to all the things that God has to say through Paul in this passage. So, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 through 31. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the understanding of those who have understanding, I will confound. Where is the wise person? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Somebody raise your hand and I say, I believe. I believe. Hallelujah. All right. We are the foolish according to the world and the wise of God. Praise God. You've got wisdom already when you said that. Hallelujah. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than mankind, and the weakness of God is stronger than mankind. Hallelujah. Our God is mighty. Do you notice here that the power of God and the wisdom of God are inextricably linked together? I'll say again in verse 24, But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Hallelujah. The wisdom and the power of God come together in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the insignificant things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no human may boast before God. But it is due to him that you are in Christ Jesus. Who? Him. 
And you mean I didn't get saved because I chose God? What? He chose us. If you're here today, Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. He reached down right out of heaven, plucked you out of the mire, and said, you're mine. And he brought you under conviction and gave you faith so that you could receive Jesus as your Savior. Hallelujah. That's exciting news. Oh, praise God. It's not an accident that you're here. It's not an accident that you're watching online. It is not an accident. We are the beloved of the Father. He has drawn us out from the world and given us new life through Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. But it is due to him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let the one who boasts... Boast in the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. I boast in Jesus. I know that I am saved by grace. It wasn't anything I did. In fact, I deserve destruction. I deserve it now. But God Almighty has loved me and declared that I'm his. And he said, you are sanctified. You are righteous. You are justified and redeemed. Hallelujah. It's not anything I did. It's not anything you can do. It's what he has done for us. Praise God. Hallelujah. The Corinthian church... They thought themselves to be wise. They had a lot going on there. You know, they were people called out of the worst kind of uh, paganism. And so, you know, they were feeling pretty holy about themselves because, look, they were surrounded by people who were doing just perverse evil. So we must be pretty good, right? And they felt good about themselves. The power of God was manifesting clearly in that church. A lot of the gifts were there. That's why Paul wrote so specifically to them in chapters 12, 13, and 14, about the gifts of the Spirit, the sign gifts, the power gifts. However, though they were feeling pretty high and mighty, there was a lot of problems in that church. Paul tells them that the wisdom that they esteem is not the wisdom of God, but merely their own boasting. Like, look at what God's doing with me. He's lucky to have me around, you know? And they were, you know, rushing to the to the Lord's Supper and taking the best for themselves and other people who were lacking, they just ignored them. You know, it's like, oh, I got mine. That's what matters. There's a reason that Paul spent an entire chapter talking about love to the first Corinthians, the first Corinthian church. So, God's wisdom is embodied in Jesus, who gave himself for us all. In fact, Jesus isn't just wisdom to us from God, but he is righteousness, sanctification, and redemption as well. We are made righteous through him. We are sanctified, that is, set apart to God's work through him. And we are redeemed from the hordes of lost and condemned people through our faith in Jesus. We couldn't do this for ourselves. Let me say that again. We couldn't do this for ourselves. But Jesus, in an act of outrageous love, did it for us. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. We cannot boast in ourselves because we were not able to save ourselves. However, we can boast in the Lord, for he has saved us in spite of our many failures. Last night, I was just, you know, relaxing after an incredibly hard day of doing all the chores around the house that I'd let pile up for the last couple of months because I'd been busy. So I worked like a dog yesterday. It was terrible. And I'm still sore today. I hope you all will just, you know, appreciate how great it is that I'm here before you in spite of all that pain. So, amen, Louis. He does. So I'm sitting down. I'm relaxing. And, and various muscles in my body are twitching, you know, because I'm still, like, tired and, and overdone. Cooked out there in the sun, I might add. But... So I'm just bopping around as I was thinking, just preparing my mind for today, you know, and, uh, and I received a message on Facebook from an old friend. I've known this guy for 50 years, well, 40 years anyway, um, and he, this message pops up on Facebook and it says, religion, comedy for the intelligent, reality for the ignorant. I felt like somebody slapped me, you know, and I thought, hmm. How do I respond to this? Because he is an old friend, and though he's, you know, he's lost as lost can be, I still care about him, you know. And uh, so 
So I pondered that for a moment, and I thought, Lord, what is your wisdom in this situation? And, you know, I recognized that this friend was laboring under the same delusion that Paul spoke to the Corinthians about. When Paul said, for the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That is the same thought process here. It's my friend thinks that religion and faith are foolishness. But I know, as Paul also said, the foolishness of God is wiser than mankind and the weakness of God is stronger than mankind. I thought about my friend's post and I said, Lord, what, how should I respond to this? I felt like I could not let it pass by. There's a lot of stuff I just let roll on by on Facebook because honestly you could spend your whole life you know, arguing with people or, or speaking to people on Facebook. It's a massive waste of time, which is why I don't spend much time there. But I had seen this and I felt I had to respond. And so I said, I wrote this in response. Ah, yes, religion is for the ignorant. Given that not one of us can know for certain what will happen tomorrow, and none of us can trace the confluence of seemingly random events that affected us today, I'd say that we're all pretty darned ignorant. I also told them, I am happy to acknowledge the hand of God Almighty in my life. His gift of salvation through faith in his son Jesus is the single greatest gift in my life. People of the world think themselves wise. Paul acknowledges that here. People of the world think they've got a grip on reality, when in point of fact, they don't know anything about reality. God Almighty, who created the universe, is willing to let us know him, but under his terms, not our own. We don't get to be the judge of God and his creation. He is the judge. We are his creation. And as such, we are here to receive, not to give. We have nothing to give God, but that which he has given to us. I hold out hope that my friend will reconsider his thinking on religion and God, but I was happy that the Lord gave me the response that I sent to him. I thought that was a pretty smart response, certainly not from me. You know, I mean, if it was left up to me, it was like, oh, yeah, you know, but, uh, but God gave me something to say that was, I think, meaningful. It might make him think. You know, as a young man many years ago, I was asked to be a deacon in the Baptist church that I attended, and I said, okay, I felt like that was something I could do, and then I was told that I should consider teaching a Sunday school class, which was not something I was planning on, and guess what? They had a class of nine and ten-year-old boys without a teacher, and they were just looking for me to, to teach that class. I'm not certain of this, but I suspect that the previous teacher may have had a crisis of faith and perhaps a mental breakdown after teaching those kids. They were unruly. I know that it took a lot out of me when I started. They knocked me down to size right quick. Nevertheless, I took on that challenge and taught those kids for a couple of years. Now, there was a woman, Patty McKay, who was a few years older than I, who was teaching the girls of the same, of the same age. She said to me that we should get together and pray for our classes. You know, I hadn't even thought about doing this. But when she said it, I realized that she was right. Well, of course. When we got together to plan lessons, we prayed for the classes, and Patty said to me, I think that we should pray for wisdom. Having attempted to teach the kids for a couple of Sundays, I, I agreed with her. I certainly needed that. So what started as a cry for help in reaching these kids in our classes turned into a prayer that I continue to pray to this day. It turns out that God is only too happy to grant this request for wisdom. You know, Solomon, King Solomon, when God said to him as he, as he became the ruler over Israel, he said to him, ask of me what you will. And Solomon said, recognizing his need, Solomon said, please give me wisdom. And God was so pleased with that request that he said, not only am I going to give you wisdom, I'm going to give you prosperity, peace, joy, all these things that come from above. You will be the ruler of this entire nation, and, you know, the power of God will be behind you. So he sought wisdom and obtained everything else that God could provide. 
Well, both Patty and I began to see results with the kids in our charge, and I personally realized that God was revealing things to me from his word that I had never noticed before. You ever had that happen? You're just reading the Bible, and something just, boom, pops right out of it, seems like, and it's like it's in technicolor, and suddenly you realize that there's a truth here that you didn't know before, one that just is compelling and life-changing, and it may be in a passage you've read 50 times before. Looking back now over the decades, I remain extremely grateful for Patty's recommendation of prayer topics, and even more grateful to Jesus Christ, who is the power and wisdom of God, and who has shared freely with me his wisdom from on high. Now, I know you guys may be looking at me and saying, well, Tom, you don't seem so wise to me. And my response to you would be, consider the alternative. I could have been a lot worse, you know. So, uh, you know, um, I, I tell you, I have the wisdom of God. So, well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, Paul says, My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of mankind, but on the power of God. It seems, as we see through these passages here, that power and wisdom keep being linked together. They are not separate attributes of God, but they are two things that work together to display God's wisdom to the world. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. For example, if I say to you, God is good, you say, yes, Brother Tom, God is good all the time. Yeah. But if you're there and you're bleeding and hurting, and I say, God is good, be healed, and God heals you, that's a whole other kind of revelation of God's goodness, is it not? I believe the power and the wisdom of God come together in the work of the gospel and in the exercise of faith that we are called to present to the world. We are not called just to say God is good. We are not called just to say you need a savior. We are called to demonstrate the power of God and the wisdom of God as we minister to others. If you're not expecting the power of God to work in your life and in the lives of others, then you are missing, I dare say, the wisdom of God because the two things go together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Further in chapter 2, <clears throat> starting in verse 6, I'm just going to read through this. Uh, it's a lot, but I'm just going to make a couple of points here. <clears throat> Starting in, uh, what is that, verse 6, yes. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are passing away. But we speak of God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the human heart, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things. Get this even the depths of God. For who among people knows the thoughts of a person except the spirit of the person that is in him? So also the thoughts of God no one knows except the spirit of God. Amen. Now we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. We also speak these things not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, 
for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. How are they discerned? Spiritually. But the one who is spiritual discerns all things. Yet he himself is discerned by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now this is quite the dissertation right here. And I do not presume that I am going to, you know, amplify all of this for you. But I want to make a key point out of this. Paul returns to a thought I made previously about we are spiritual beings, and we were made to be spiritual beings by our Creator. We do not discern the things of God out of our intellect, which is not to say I dismiss our intellect. God gave us mind, we should use it. But how do we discern these deeper things, the wisdom of God? We discern it in the spirit. The spirit of man merges with the spirit of God through Christ Jesus. And we are one with him. Friends, this is the greatest miracle I know of in the whole of creation. That God, who is so great and so powerful, wants us to be in that kind of close fellowship with him where we and he are one not two not one and a half one hallelujah what is the last sentence paul says we have the mind of christ you may say tom i don't see that i you know i live my life every day and it just seems like another mundane day you know nothing special going on to which I say, that's on you, buddy, because God wants to bless you and have communion with you. If you're not having that communion, it's not because God turned aside and said, I'll check with you later. Rather, it's because you have decided that you don't need to spend time in fellowship with the Lord. And you may say, but I intend to spend time with the Lord every day. But if you're feeling that way, clearly you were not managing it. So I would challenge each and every one of you Take some time to be in God's word, to be speaking with the Lord, to be just communing with him. Because, well, I had a friend, my wife's best friend, one of, certainly one of her best friends. She calls the house so many times every day that I, I jokingly said, it's the car warranty lady again, you know, so, because uh, she just calls all the time. Have you ever, any of you have that happening? So... So she now, she heard that, laughed uproariously, and now every time she calls, she says, I've got this deal for you on a warranty, and uh, she never lets it go. The woman is just incredible. But anyway, yesterday she was calling, and, um, and I was thinking about her. And <clears throat> when she calls, I don't need anything to tell me who's calling. I don't need the phone to tell me it's Val. I don't need her to say, hi, it's Val. No, as soon as I hear her voice, I know who it is. It's Val. She is my friend. She's Karen's friend. And I've heard her voice, and I'm comfortable that I know her voice. I recognize it. I would recognize her voice across a crowded room. And why is that? Because I've spent a lot of time with her. She's been a guest in my home. I've been a guest in her home. And we've spent a lot of time together. If you want to hear the voice of God, it is no different. You have to spend time with him. And as you do so, you become acquainted with his voice. And you recognize when he's speaking. And you discern accurately what voice you're hearing. I have people come up to me and they tell me, God said to do this. And I say, wait a minute. God told you to go shoot somebody? I don't think so. That's not God's way. You know, I know you may feel that way and you may feel justified in it, but that was not the voice of God. Or, you know, I think God's calling me to, uh, I, I, that man over there is the one I'm supposed to marry. And wait a minute, sister. That guy's married and has kids, you know. And he's got a life. You don't get to go and break that up and, not, and, and be faithful to God. But you hear this nonsense coming out of people's mouths because they are not capable of recognizing the voice of the Lord 
And so they're led astray by every lying voice the devil sends past them. That's a terrible thing. But it's not an insurmountable thing. All they have to do is dedicate themselves to spending some time in God's word and in communion with him. Just, here I am, Lord. Show me your way through your Holy Spirit. And if you ask God to send his Holy Spirit to guide you into truth and wisdom, not only is he going to do it, he's not going to allow the devil to insert himself in there and pretend to be the Holy Spirit. I think that's one of those scenes where the Holy Spirit is doing that to the devil, you know, kicking him out of the way. And says, not you, buddy. I'm on the job. So, we are spiritual beings, and we recognize the truth of God's word through the Spirit. I recently had the opportunity to minister to a couple uh, who were um, having some issues in their life. They're, they both came out of kind of messed up backgrounds, but they found the Lord, and then they found each other, and they've been married for several years, have some kids, and beautiful people. And it's not like they were in you know, dire distress, but they were certainly having some issues in their life, and they asked for ministry. And so, pardon me. Um, so I was asked to come and consult with them, along with my buddy Rick Thompson, pastor over at Living Water. And so we were praying there with them, and um, um, where was I going with this story? The... Uh, the the fact is that, the, that they had listened to counsel that was not good. And they had gotten themselves all tied up in knots because of it, you know. And they were attempting to resolve the problems in their life with the same defensive techniques they'd used as little three- and four-year-olds when they were being abused, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. You know, little kids come up with the best plan they have to deal with abuse. And the tragedy of that is people can be 40 and they're still attempting to use the techniques they used when they were four to address the issues in their lives. So we spent some time with them in prayer. We spent some time pointing them to the word and pointing out that some of the things they were believing just weren't of God. They weren't in the word, you know. And when we pointed to the things that God did have to say about the situation, it was wonderful to see the release that they got. They just got set free, you know, in the moment. It, it was glorious. And then, you know, we ended up ministering deliverance to them and stuff, and they, they, it was just glorious. The devil got sent packing, and God was glorified, you know. And it was a wonderful thing to see. But I just, I thought of them just now because I was talking about how we recognize the voice of the Lord. And they were unfortunately misdiagnosing the situation and thinking they were hearing from the Lord when they were really just responding in the flesh to a situation that was troubling. We don't have to do that. We can study God's word. We can spend time with the Lord in prayer. We can walk with him, and he will guide us into all truth. Because... We have the mind of Christ. You may think you're not capable. You may think you are not good enough, that you are not enough to uh, get things right or make your way through this world. But I assure you that everything that you need has been already given to you. You need but ask, and God will give you more. He gives abundantly. He gives with more than we can contain. He doesn't just give us, well, that'll be enough. No, he gives us wealth and blessings, abundant blessings, spiritual goodness and kindness and love and power and might. Oh, he gives us wisdom and guidance from on high. We have an abundance beyond all that we think to ask. So, I was afraid I might not get through this message, but in fact, it's rocking right along. So, Praise God. I challenge you, each of you, to uh, seek the wisdom of God for yourself and for others. It's not enough that we receive wisdom so that we can persevere and get through life. 
We weren't put here just to survive. We were put here to conquer. We came, we have come as a conquering army to kick the devil's butt, to drive him out of this world, to inspire others, to receive Jesus as their Savior, to join this mighty army of God, and to fellowship with us and to help us in conquering the devil and his influence in the world. We live in a fallen world, but we are not of it. We're just in it. You are special people. You have been blessed by God Almighty, and the power of the Holy Spirit is alive in you. And if you're saying, I don't feel that power, ask God. He will give you that power. Those people that I was talking about a minute ago, they were, they were sitting there, had been feeling defeated and struggling, and then said, by the way, have you ever asked the, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And, they, and the one said, yeah, nothing happened. And the other one said, no. And I said, well, here's what I know about this. If you ask, you will receive. So none of this, oh, nothing happened. Nuh-uh. No, something happened, and you give glory to God for it, and more will happen. So we prayed with them right then to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and that girl, she just opened up. She was praying in tongues. She was rejoicing in God. It was a glorious time. I began to feel a little envious. I think she was a little more filled with the Holy Spirit than I was. It was, you know, really cool. And her husband, he was a little more reluctant, but he, he was asking, but he was a little more reluctant to open his mouth and pray in tongues. But I said to him, I said, say, thank you. You've asked God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You have received it. And he said, I've never felt peace in my whole life, ever. Can you imagine that? Never felt peace. And he said, I just felt peace for the first time in my life. God gave him what he needed in that moment. It was such a blessing. God will give you what you need as well. You need only ask in faith and believe. Don't ask and say, oh, just like I thought, nothing's happening. What kind of faith is that? Instead, say, Lord, I believe you, and I believe that I receive right now. I thank you for it. Before it's even happened in my life, I thank you for it because I know you're faithful, and you don't turn aside your children. So I receive it right now with joy, and I expect the manifestation, and I'm thanking you for it in advance in Jesus' name. Now, that's the kind of faith God's going to bless. He's going to get behind that and say, yeah, yes, and amen. Okay. Well, if you're here today and you've got a need in your life, we welcome you to come down here as the band plays, and um, uh, some of us will be here to pray with you, and I believe God is going to meet those needs. This is not the kind of church that says God could have, should have, would have. Sometime, I believe God's here right now to minister to the needs of his people. And if you have a need, don't hold back. You come down and let some of these people pray with you because God is going to meet your needs. Amen. Now, by the way, if you're online and you heard this message today, I want to encourage you to study 1 Corinthians uh, chapters 1 through 4. You'll see a lot there about the wisdom of God and our rights as Christians in receiving that wisdom. Amen.